yeah, now we're going to just kick things off with a little welcome back video. Hi, I'm Ken Davenport. My team and I are on a mission to help 5,000 shows get produced by the year 2025. I started the producer's perspective over a decade ago to demystify the business of Broadway, challenge some norms, accept others, and amplify the conversation about the theater. As readership has grown over the years, I've listened to the challenges that many of you face and have created several initiatives to help you overcome your obstacles on the path to production. Our writers groups and mastermind programs help hold you accountable. The Producers Perspective Pro provides all the tools and training you need to succeed, and the inner circle helps advanced career professionals get their project to the next stage. And the Super Conference is the perfect opportunity to hear from heavy hitters in the industry and connect you with other people who face the same challenges. At the Producers Perspective, we believe theater changes lives and makes the world a better place. We believe in delivering solutions. We create. We don't procrastinate. Impossible is not in our vocabulary. We inspire. We don't wait for inspiration to strike. We make a living. We don't just make theater. We set the stage for success. We don't wait for the phone to ring. We are part of a supportive, sad community. We take risks. We aren't afraid to do this. Other people don't. We learn from our mistakes. We don't dwell on them. We believe that your success is our success. We believe that everyone has a talent and that with the right tools and training, you can achieve your dreams. We believe. We believe. We believe. We, at the producer's perspective, are thankful for our customers and clients. Mm -hmm. We're inspired by you. We admire your hard work and dedication. We got your back, and we want you to succeed. But yes, here we are. Um, great, so we're going to move on now to a very special presentation. We have M. Kilberg Reedy here. Um, she helped found the law firm Feldman, Galinsky, Reedy, and Benzi. And she is an expert speci specifically in theater law. So she's going to kick things off for us here. And she has a lot to cover. She's going to talk about some rights agreements as well as business structure. So welcome to the stage, M. Kilberg Reedy. choosing these, these two topics is because they're really fundamental. The, uh, the, the, the rights agreements that you have as a producer 
are basically the only assets of your company. The production rights agreement and the underlying rights agreement. We'll be getting to those with specificity in a moment. And uh, then the structure is how you take in money and how you how money goes out, how money comes in, goes out, how you manage your business. Um, so I'm going to start with, uh, let's see, let's try this up here. Okay, so basics, we're going to start with the rights agreements and then I'll tell you, then we'll go into business structure to show you how to use those rights agreements. Um, so first of all, we're going to start with what is a contract? Uh, a contract, since we're in the business of storytelling, I'm going to frame it like this. It's a contract is like a story. Uh, it's like storytelling. It's like the story of a relationship between parties. Uh, we, first of all, we need to know um, what is, uh, who are the parties to the contract, um, what do they want from each other, uh, what kind of uh, compensation changes hands, if any, um, how do we resolve disputes? How do we uh, terminate the relationship if it goes wrong, or even if it goes right? How do things wind up? So it, that's uh, that's kind of a framework, and I'm trying today to give you a little bit of a sense of how to think about contracts and rights agreements. A contract is defined as an agreement between two or more parties creating obligations enforceable by law. The basic elements of a contract are mutual agreement as to terms and conditions. Consideration, which means something of value. Uh, capacity, which means the ability of the, the parties to enter into a contract. Uh, you have to be, um, you have to be of a certain legal age and a certain mental capacity to form a valid contract legally. And then legality, you can't form a contract for any legal, illegal purpose. So what is consideration? Consideration is anything of value promised to another when making a contract. This can be money, it can be a physical object, it can be a service, it can be a promised action, or it can be a promise to abstain from an action, and other things. What is an option? This is what we're going to talk about in terms of uh, production rights agreements and, um, and underlying rights agreements today. Most contracts are bilateral, an exchange of promises. Um, for instance, a publishing contract, the publisher actually promises to publish the book in exchange for uh, the rights uh, uh, to do so. Uh, and there's also um, remuneration involved with that. An option that you're going to enter into as a producer is a unilateral contract. It's a type of contract to purchase the right during a certain period of time to purchase property at a stated price stated price or require another to perform upon agreed upon terms. Um, for example, a production contract or an underlying <coughs> rights agreement. The producer gets the right to produce within a window of time, but the producer is not obligated to produce within a window of time. And that is also true of an option for underlying rights. You get the right to create a musical or play, but you don't have to. Um, uh, and for the, oh, sorry, I should say, for that reason you end up paying, the consideration that you pay is you pay, you, you have to pay some kind of um, money for that or, um, or an, another sort of uh, consideration, which we can get to in a moment. Um, so, uh, and one thing, another thing you need to know about contracts for intellectual property, i.e. Uh, a play, a musical, underlying property that you want to turn into a play or musical is that contracts involving copyrights always have to be in writing. Um, there's, uh, this is, uh, uh, and in theater, we are, we usually are in the world of license instead of work made for hire <coughs> or transfer of copyright. You know, you're going to buy a play, you license a play. Um, in theater, in uh, film, it's a little bit different. In film, you get an assignment of copyright for the right to make a film, and then the producer owns the film, and everybody who contributes to the film is doing so on a work made for hire basis. So all of the copyrights end up in the hands of the producer. But in theater, the producer is only getting a license in the property that he or she is producing. They don't have any ownership rights in the property at all. 
Um, to talk about contracts, people often come to me as a lawyer and ask me, well, what are the standard, what are the standard terms? What's the standard? I'll just, I'll just give me a standard agreement. But it's very hard to, uh, to say exactly what a standard agreement is. There's a certain universe of standard terms that are common to each type of agreement, but it's, um, it, these are always subject to negotiation. It's not a, people will say, well, what's the law on that? Well, there, it's not a matter of law, what's in the contract, um, except for the four elements I described earlier that constitute a valid contract. But it's a matter of standard industry practice. For uh, optioning a play for Broadway, we know what the contract looks like. Uh, a, a play or musical for Broadway is subject to an approved production contract um, for, uh, for the dramatist skills which is the standard we use for Broadway. Other contracts, <coughs> for instance, for an off-Broadway contract that converts to an APC or underlying rights agreements, other contracts are negotiable within a standard range. Another factor we look at when we determine what uh, provisions go into a contract, what, is, what, what terms are, is the relative bargaining power of the parties. And I've uh, given you a little acronym there, RBP. Uh, RBP for relative bargaining power, that's going to come up again, not to be confused with our rock star Supreme Court Justice. <laughs> um, the, the relative bargaining power is determined by um, the industry stature of the parties, the prominence of, of, of the parties, um, and, and, and sometimes by the desire of the parties. Like which party, it depends on uh, uh, which party wants the deal more can sometimes determine what the what the terms and then provisions of the contract are. If someone really wants uh, a deal to happen, they will be more cooperative and, and less insistent on terms favorable to themselves. If um, if they could take it or leave it, then they they will walk away if they're not offered the terms that they want. So uh, now these are, uh, this list here is some types of theater contracts. You might see a collaboration agreement, that's a, an agreement between people who are co-writing a play or a musical, um, specifying what the terms are uh, between them as to ownership and credit and division of revenues and responsibilities. Uh, you would see, you might see a joint venture agreement among lead producers, uh, how people who are banding together to produce a play or a musical are going to handle the same issues, responsibilities, division of revenue, um, credit, and so forth. You could see a co-producer agreement between a lead producer and a co-producer uh, or investor contributing substantial capital. Um, you might see um, an enhancement agreement. This is not on the list. But it will be the next time I make this list. Uh, an enhancement agreement, which is the agreement between a commercial producer and uh, a not-for-profit theater that um, that the producer, the commercial producer, wants to present uh, his or her developing play or musical at. Um, and then the last two on the list are the ones we're going to cover today: the production rights agreement. Uh, which can be an off-Broadway, commercial off-Broadway contract with a conversion, conversion right to Broadway, or it could be an APC right from the get-go, if you know for sure you're going right to Broadway. And uh, then the underlying rights agreement for those instances when a producer wants to acquire a property in order to turn it into a player on these. I'm going to hydrate for a moment here because <laughs> okay, moving on. So, starting with, uh, we just covered what these are. Um, so, just starting with this, moving on from this slide. So, um, just to cover um, examples of underlying rights, if you're, a, if you're a producer who wants to create something, or if you're an author who wants to create something, these are examples of play to musical. My Fair Lady was based on a George Bernard Shaw play, Pygmalion, which is no longer in copyright, but was when Lerner and Lowe were writing My Fair Lady. And um, that's an instance where the Lerner and Lowe went out and got the rights themselves. There was no producer involved. They just decided that they wanted to write this musical and they were going to 
get the rights to it. Uh, play a film to play or musical. Some current examples of that on the Broadway stages are Network of the Patty Chayefsky film, which has been turned into a, a, a live stage play, and Waitress, an independent film that has been turned into a very successful musical. A book to play or musical. Um, Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird uh, is now, a, is not a previous stage adaptation, it now has a new one written by Aaron Sorkin. Um, and uh, the, the musical Wicked was based on a novel. And then there are other kinds of, uh, there have been all kinds of other different uh, properties that have been turned into musicals along the way. You could use poems like the Wicked Part, the, um, the Wild Party songs, short stories, record albums, Hades Town is an example of that coming in. It's really, you're really limited only by your imagination. So the parties to a contract, in the case of, now I'm going to, um, uh, I'm going to um, start, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna divide this into sections. So uh, uh, parties to a contract in the case of a play or a musical, a producer always options a play or a musical from the author, uh, which could be one or more people. In the case of an underlying work, the producer it's typically the producer who options the underlying work from the owner and then puts the team together, right? The writing team, playwright, or, book, or composer, book writer, and lyricist. Um, but <coughs> typically an author requires underlying rights, as I told you, Lerner and Lowe went after the rights to George Bernard Shaw's Pygmalion. Uh, a more recent example is um, Grey Gardens, where the authors had the idea to turn the documentary into a musical, and they hired lawyers and pursued those rights. But most typically, uh, the producer acquires the rights, and if a producer does so, these are assigned to the author of the merger. Um, merger is a concept unique to theater that we're going to cover in a little bit of detail later on, but for now, all you need to know is that there is a thing called merger in musical theater, and um, that, that um, these, these rights, uh, the rights that the producer acquires pursuant to an underlying work are eventually assigned to the author. Um, so okay, now to talk about the, um, <coughs> you know, as we as we said, there are different. Um, the, the, when we talk about a contract, the story of a relationship, who are the parties, what do they want from each other? This is the what do they want from each other part. The grant of rights. In the case of plays or musicals, on the left, uh, the um, the producer is getting the option to produce and present commercial live stage productions, including first and second class. Uh, Broadway, off-Broadway, touring and sit-down, and development productions. The option is exercised by producing. Uh, the, the rights granted to the producer can be exclusive or non-exclusive. We always prefer to get exclusive rights, but if it's non-exclusive, you, uh, you will certainly ask for holdbacks to keep the owner of that property from exercising any rights elsewhere while you have rights in a certain territory. Um, for a musical or play, um, the, the uh, territory usually start with the US and Canada, English speaking territories. You might have uh, other foreign uh, countries that you're allowed to produce in, especially if it's a musical. There's always a broader grant of territory rights for musicals. Um, and uh, for a play, a play or musical, you get promotional and merchandising rights. Uh, for a musical, you get cast out. Uh, in the case of an underlying work, uh, you are gaining the right to option, and uh, you, you're gaining an option to create, produce, and exploit a play or a musical as a derivative work based on the underlying property. Uh, and the option, again, is exercised by producing. Uh, this can be a, a, an exclusive or non-exclusive grant. Again, you see holdbacks if it's non-exclusive. For an underlying work, very often you won't be able to get uh, a worldwide territory until after a merger point. Uh, you will start out with the US and Canada and possibly London if your lawyer is very persistent. And then once you have produ produced the initial commercial production of, of, of the musical that you create based on the underlying work, musical or play, then you will be able to produce and exploit it all the way around the world. Uh, you will also get um, the rights to uh, exploit subsidiary uh, rights uses 
in the um, uh, in the derivative work that is based on the underlying work. Uh, when I say derivative work, I mean player musical. And uh, those will include merchandising, cast album, all live stage publishing, and hopefully audio visual. Uh, in the case of uh, a film that you're optioning, you might have restrictions on audio visual rights that we will discuss in some of the further down the charts. Um, ownership of copyright. Uh, as I said before, the, in the case of a play or a musical that a producer is optioning, then the producer will always, uh, the author will always retain the copyright in the play or musical. Uh, the producer gets a license, and not a purchaser assignment of copyright. No work made for hire. That's what the. Oops, sorry. I was trying to. There we go. Just trying to do this. This is a multifunction. WMFH, again, stands for Work Made for Hire. Um, the exceptions to, uh, uh, sorry. Oh, the exception to an instance where it, the, uh, the writer owns their work is that if, if someone, if a, if a producer hires a famous author, or even a non-famous author, to do revisions to a, to a pre-existing musical, say a classic from the 1950s that needs to be spruced up a little bit, you might hire uh, you might hire someone to do that, and um, that work could be a, a derivative work based on the underlying work that would be owned by you know the Rogers and Hammerstein organization or the Lerner and Lowe people, whoever whoever work it is that is being uh, spruced up. Um, in the case of the underlying work, the ownership of copyright, the the producer is getting the right. Again, here, the, getting the right to create a derivative work based on the underlying work. The copyright in the underlying work stays with the owner of the copyrighted work, like the Harper Lee estate still owns the copyright in the novel um, To Kill a Mockingbird. But the new, uh, the new derivative work is owned by the author of the derivative work. So Aaron Sorkin will now own the copyright in his version, his stage version of To Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, in the case of a uh, Producer getting the rights, as I said before, getting the rights to uh, create a, to create a derivative work, getting getting rights in an underlying work. Uh, that producer will eventually sign assign those rights to the author following merger, and then at that point, the author will be allowed to exploit their derivative work without restriction by producer. Um, option periods and payments uh, for, I'm going to go through some of these numbers, but they're not, I don't want anybody to um, uh, you know, get stressed by the numbers. These are easy to look up in the case of the ABC, so uh, you, we won't, I won't dwell on the numbers. Um, or in the case of uh, off-Broadway, we have um, for, for an off-Broadway, typical off-Broadway contract will be for a three-year period. It could be anywhere from 2,500 to 5,000 a year per option year. Uh, for a Broadway APC, you get a, a two years for a play. You get um, you get a, you, and you get uh, three years for a musical. These are the numbers. But um, like I said, don't worry about that. You can look that up in the APC, or I can. I told Chris that I will um, make this deck available. Uh, another provision will be whether an option payment is applicable against royalties in advance. Uh, the, uh, in the case of, sometimes you might find a pre-option. Um, in the case of a producer maybe optioning something for a year in order to, uh, to try out what they can do with it. Uh, the, in that case, the consideration is a, a promise of the producer to exert best efforts in order to, uh, to try to get something going with the property, to shop it around. Um, you might find that when you have an option, uh, you can have the first two years just up upon payment of the <coughs> money that you have agreed to, but um, the third year you have to show some progress to production, like um, a commitment from a theater or a developmental production or a commitment from a director. And again, you're always going to find the um, uh, relative bargaining power of the parties to be a factor in your negotiations. For an owner of the underlying work, and when you when you option uh, an underlying work, you will need a 
longer option period because you need time for the authors that you're hiring to write it, uh, to write the musical or play. Um, the value of the property uh, determines the option payments. There can be a wide range of numbers in this regard. I've seen movies option for as little as $5,000 a year. I've also seen uh, movies, uh, movies and books option for six figures, and se even seven figure sums. Um, then we also negotiate whether the option payment is applicable against royalties or advance. And the advance that you pay the owner is usually a percentage share of uh, the author advance. Um, again, there's some, these factors on the bottom are equally applicable to an underlying work. Uh, advance, I'm gonna kind of blow through. This is, um, this is, this doesn't always apply. It doesn't necessarily apply to an underlying work. It doesn't necessarily apply uh, to a, an off-Broadway production, but it, it, it will, it does come into play for an ABC and these are the numbers. Royalties. Uh, royalties, we have a couple of different ways of calculating royalties in commercial theater. One is based on gross weekly box office receipts. That's historically the way that we calculate royalties. Um, it, uh, going back a couple of centuries, a royalty is a percentage of revenue from the ticket sales, with, only with, in, this, in the modern age, deductions for, um, uh, for uh, credit cards uh, off-Broadway. And then when you're on Broadway, you have to deduct the credit card charges plus an allocation for union, pension, and health. If you're paying royalties to your creatives or to your underlying rights holder uh, based on, um, uh, based on uh, weekly box office receipts, there is no guaranteed minimum royalty. A weekly operating profits royalty on the right here is something that has arisen in the last, I would say, 30 years or so um, since the 80s and 90s, this was an alternative way of calculating royalties that arose during a really uh, difficult time in theater's history when, when um, Broadway was kind of on the ropes and producers were finding, trying to find a way to keep plays running uh, where the money that was coming in for tickets wasn't immediately siphoned off for royalties uh, to the creatives where, where they could find a way of paying their costs first and then paying the creatives for their work uh, after the weekly operating costs. In other words, the people who show up to the theater had to be paid first before they um, uh, before they uh, gave money to the creatives, the, to the intellectual property holders. Um, the, um, so a the weekly operating profits is, does, does get people who are receiving a royalty on the operating profits do get a minimum weekly guarantee, but their royalty consists of the, uh, a percentage of the operating profits of the production that week, which is the amount above the costs between the between the uh, the amount between the ticket revenue and the costs of running the production. The remainder of that is the weekly operating profits, and you get a royalty participants get a, a larger percentage of a smaller number. Royalties. This is. These are what, what the royalties that the author of a play and a musical get. Um, they specify uh, off Broadway. It's eight, six percent usually, increasing to seven or eight percent on gross. For a Broadway play, it's five percent, increasing to ten percent. And then I've given some numbers there for what it is in terms of the weekly operating profits royalty. For uh, the owner of an underlying work, the Percentage is um, uh, the, the underlying work owner gets a royalty based on a percentage of the author royalty. In, in a, the case of a play, the author of the play has to split their royalty with the underlying rights owner. And then in the case of a musical, the royalty is paid on top of the royalty to the uh, to the uh, book, music, and lyrics writers, and it's not uh, does not dilute their share. I'm going to move on because I can see from uh, my time is elapsing. Um, a, com a common um, common provisions that you will find in uh, in um, common provisions that you will find in a rights agreement, either a production rights agreement or an underlying rights agreement, are approval 
principles. In the case of author, they get to approve any changes to the script. Um, in, under the APC, the producer also approves changes. In the case of a play, uh, they, there are specific categories of approval. For a musical, you get all, the author gets all the approvals of the above, plus they get the approval of the certain, the, uh, the particular uh, categories of performance of services that are applicable only to a musical. In the case of an underlying work, the owner only gets approval over the creative team usually. They don't get necessarily any approval over the script or the songs. Um, and uh, again, uh, that might be that, that might be subject to uh, relative bargaining power of parties. Again, someone the owner of a very valuable property might insist on more approvals and more control over the resulting product. Uh, in, in this, uh, you also need to get give, make sure that your author and your underlying work owner will get a certain amount of uh, credit. They, the author gets uh, credit everywhere the title appears, subject to customary inter industry exclusions. It's a specific, specified size, uh, and uh, there are other certain restrictions that um, that uh, apply to an author and also to uh, the owner of an underlying work. The producer, uh, this is a, a producer. You, as a producer, will always get a credit uh, if you are successful in producing the play at a, at a certain level, you will be accredited in published editions of the play and the for subject, subsequent productions. And you will uh, require it by contract that the author give you uh, a credit in any audiovisual audio production of the play or musical on a best efforts basis. Subsidiary rights is an important section that we need to talk about. Um, this is the right of a producer to vest in a share of author's revenue from the disposition of subsidiary rights in a musical or play. The subrights include stock and amateur rights, merchandising, motion picture, television, other media, and sometimes sales of published copies uh, of the play. Agents try to, try to keep producers from participating in that, and producers try to get that. Uh, cast album for a musical play is something that producers participate in, but. Uh, there's no, but they never produce, uh, participate in separate musical composition revenue. In other words, the composer and lyricist's revenue from the songs, the individual songs in the musical. Um, they have given you a couple of menus here for how, how a producer gets that. Sorry, they don't need to do that. Okay, we'll move on to merger. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, merger, which is an important thing, running low on time, so I will just forge ahead. Merger is a contractual provision unique to theater that pertains to the rights to control dispositions of the play or musical once it has been written and produced. Um, for musicals only, um, after a qualifying uh, number and type of per uh, performances, the book, music, and lyrics merge exclusively for full term of copyright in a musical. This is when you're talking about a, mu a musical not based on underlying property say original musicals only. In the case of a property based on the underlying work, again, after a qualifying number of a number and type of performances, the underlying rights in the property that are acquired by the producer merge with the book, music, and lyrics for the play or musical. And, um, and this happens exclusively for the full term of copyright in the underlying work. The producer at that point assigns the underlying rights to the author, and thereafter the musical or play is controlled by the author. This is a matter of contract. It's not, it's not, uh, any, it's not necessarily the case that the musical or play is a joint <laughs> it's controlled, it has to be controlled jointly by the people who have written it, the, uh, the derivative work. Um, dispute resolution, I'm going to blow through this because this is not as important as some of the other stuff. Um, and I'd like to get on to the business structure. Termination, uh, your option could expire if you don't produce the play within the window of time that you have, or if the production is presented, then you have a continuous production and reopening rights, uh, as long as you keep producing or keep paying uh, sums of money to keep your rights alive. Um, in the case of a underlying work, again, if you don't produce within the window of time, the option could expire again and, and uh, merger occurs, the grant of rights in the, in the underlying work will continue
you could pull term of copyright in the play or musical. There is a, sometimes happens that there is a non-exclusivity or demerger if threshold income level isn't met from the derivative uh, work when it goes into stock and amateur licensing. If there's not enough income from it, then the owner of the underlying work could require the rights to come back to them so that they can license another version. You always try in a contract to make sure that your version can continue its life non-exclusively, but someone else will get a bite at the apple if you can't make your, your uh, derivative work successful. Um, provisions unique to underlying rights agreement include for film, um, uh, there's something called separated rights where the studio owns the film title and the screen, uh, the, the screenwriter owns the, the screenplay. This is, happens only in the case of an original screenplay. Uh, and um, if, if that's the case, then the underlying material that a film was based on could be optioned by itself. Um, these are common provisions that are in both the production rights agreement and an underlying rights agreement. There might be, uh, there would be travel expenses and accommodations, definitely for <coughs> authors of your play or musical. There might also be such for the uh, owner of your underlying property. There'll be a provision for performance tickets. There will be a, a, um, a, an admonition that producer has no uh, obligation to produce, and there will be, there may, there may be strict restrictions on the producer's right of assignment because when you're optioning your property to somebody, you want to make sure that that's the person who uh, is producing it and not that they can turn around and just give it to anybody. Um, in the case of, um, uh, there might be timing on, uh, uh, there, there will always be a provision for the timing of and instructions uh, for payment <laughs> statements that are required with payments and audit rights, and there will always be a section for representations, warranties, and indemnity. And then I think we are going to the next, uh, the next, the business section now, so we can cover business structure. <laughs> no, that wasn't the. The question was that wasn't the business section. <laughs> no, that amazingly enough, that wasn't the business section. The business section is going to show you how the um, how the company that you uh, are are forming to produce your play is set up and how the money comes into it and goes out of it. Um, and uh, the people in the booth are pulling up that presentation. And they'll be with us momentarily, and I will take the opportunity to kind of I didn't start it off. Yeah, the question is, any reason why I didn't mention off off Broadway? I mean, a, a, a production rights agreement for off Broadway could also include a provision for off off Broadway. Off off Broadway is 199. Yeah, yeah. Well, and he, he's saying he's mentioning equity showcases. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not really dealing with uh, uh, producing at that level. But you know, that's just a little bit too granular for this uh, performance. Uh, this, um, presentation. Feels like a performance. So <laughs> basics of commercial theater. Ta-da, here. This is, this is the structure that I want you to uh, fix in your mind. Um, so this is you here as the producer. It could be an individual or you could form a corporation or LLC. Now you've got your rights and you're going to start, this is your Broadway production producing entity. Here's the rights, this is your author, you've optioned player musical and the rights are flowing from author to you. If you had to get underlying rights, those might go from, uh, those might go directly to you or they might go, the author might have gotten those rights before they came to you with the property. But anyway, here you are with those rights and those rights, um, What the, this producer becomes the managing member of this entity here. This is your Broadway producing entity, which is typically an LLC or an LPD. We're going to call that the principal company. Investors put their money into that entity, here are the investors, and that company becomes the entity that produces the Broadway production. It pays, the, this unbroken line is money, and the broken line is rights. Uh, the, the money that comes into the producing entity goes to pay the operating expenses of your Broadway production, and then as 
as that production earns weekly operating profits, those are used to pay down the production expenses, which means those are going, the operating profits are going directly back to the investors. This is all after, after payment of office royalties. Whatever's left over goes back to the investors. 100% goes back to the investors. Once you hit the magic point of recoupment, then, then everything is divided between the producer and the investors. Typically in the United States, on Broadway, you will see 50% of adjusted net profits <coughs> to the producer, 50% to the investors. In the UK, it's usually 60% to the investors and 40% to the producer. And all, every <coughs> producer I've ever talked to says, how do you get away with 50 <laughs> It's just the custom here, and nobody questions it. Um, but uh, there might be a net profit share that goes off the top. You know, invariably, a general manager will get a two or two and a half percent of net pro net profits off the top. So then, if that's the case, then you're dividing 98 percent between producer and investors, or 97 and a half percent. And there very likely will be other net profits that are coming off the top, which reduces that number that's being split further. Um, so then, what happens is then the um, the, this producing entity uh, produces, oh, well, let's talk about subsidiary rights up first. Here's subsidiary rights up here. These are the author's rights. The author is the person, on the broken line is the author is licensing subsidiary rights, but the subsidiary rights uh, are paid, uh, the, the revenue, the unbroken line is paid back to the author and also percentage shared to the producing entity because the author recognizes that the producing uh, entity, the producer has conveyed value on the, under, on, on the property by producing it at a, at a prominent level. Um, and, we, uh, and then the producing entity is licensing, <coughs> suppose you're successful on Broadway and you're going to mount a tour, the producing entity mounts, uh, uh, licenses rights to the touring company and the touring company pays back revenue to the, the principal company from, uh, from, the, from the successful tour. Foreign rights, the same thing. Rights are licensed to create a foreign company and money gets paid back to the producing entity. Um, that's just a narrative. So it's secondary company structure. This here is uh, the principal company again, and this is the touring or foreign entity here. That was, do you remember this was the, um, when we had second, the touring company or foreign? Was over here. That's what this is here. So this is breaking this down so you understand how the secondary company is structured. This is the, the, the again the Broadway company licensing rights for the touring or the foreign company. Again, the investors come put their money into this company. It could be the same investors who invested in Broadway, or it could be some new investors, or it could be a combination of the two. Um, and then this prop this. This entity is paying down the operating expenses of the company, the touring or, or foreign company, uh, which includes a, the author royalties and a royalty of the principal company, and uh, paying down the production expenses. And when you get to that point again, you're paying net profits and you're paying adjusted net profits. Usually, in the case of a tour or a foreign company, 10% uh, of net profits goes right back up to the principal company along with the, the weekly royalty. How are we doing for time? Two minutes, okay. Well, okay, I'm gonna talk about, the usually offerings here. The offerings um, that are typically done for, for Broadway are done uh, privately. They're done under, a, um, under the Securities and Exchange Act of 1933. Typically they're under Rule 506B, which does not permit public advertising, mass mailings, or e-blasts. It uh, requires, um, that you offer to no more than 35 non-accredited investors and um, <coughs> without full offering, offering paperwork, no unaccredited investors are permitted. Uh, there is a, another more recent innovation, which is the 506C offering, which does permit <coughs> advertising, but in that case, you can only take money from accredited investors and the, the offerer must verify the, uh, the basis for the accredited investors claim to be accredited, which is a verification of net worth or income. And that is seen by a lot of Broadway producers as being too invasive. And so they, they, they don't necessarily uh, pursue that. 
Uh, accredited investor is an actual person with a net worth of a million or more, with not including their primary residence. The, um, it's also a natural person with an income of $200,000 a year uh, or, or 300000 or more in the case of a couple or an entity in which all the owners are accredited investors. Um, there are five other categories, but these are the most common ones, so these are the ones I've given. Um, offering paper, paperwork will consist of an LLC operating agreement or an LP agreement, limited partnership agreement. Um, it'll it consist of a budget and recruitment schedule or a, um, and, um, and also subscription documents with investor representations and warranties as to their suitability to invest in the show. A uh, private placement memorandum is what is used if we offer to non-accredited investors, but that is, um, uh, that is uh, something we omit if there are no non-accredited investors. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, we are, we are out of time. Um, but that being said, uh, M. Kilberg has generously agreed if, if anyone wants to request the presentation, we can provide that. Um, so I know there's a lot of information in there. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for that, that wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we anticipate that a question will be, what if I'm not ready to finance my Broadway production, <laughs> which was coming up on the next couple of slides. Do you want to ask a few questions, or would you like me to blow through that quickly? Blow through. <laughs> okay. We've got like Good. two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes for yes. us. And then yes. we, we, that's all we have for questions. Yeah. Oh God. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that was a lot of material to get through. Okay. So if you don't have the money yet for the for the um, your producing entity, then you you could take. There's two ways of taking money. One is front money agreements, which are basically a loan agreement. And uh, those are made between individuals and you as a producer. You can use that money to finance a not-for-profit production tryout. And then eventually that money becomes an investment in the producing entity, your Broadway producing entity, along with money from additional investors when you do your offering. Um, that it, the, uh, those are, like I said, those are letter agreements. Um, the investor doesn't get a uh, K-1, and they don't get a, um, you know, any kind of a, a tax write-off for it unless it's declared a bad debt, which, uh, so in some measure, it's better for you to do a development company because then these investors become uh, owners of the development <coughs> company, and which might, inv might invest in a share of subsidiary rights revenue by virtue of producing a not-for-profit production. And once it's, uh, once the development entity has, um, sorry, once the development entity has um, has received income, they can file a tax return, and then the investors will get their uh, they will get K ones uh, showing whether they've lost or, or earned money from their investment. Um, I think that I will stop there. And is there is there any time we are, we are over? Yeah. Okay, I'm so sorry. Um, well, thank you so much.